good. Now it's my time to um, give you my mm, second lecture. This is part of um, this lecture is part of the session dedicated to autoimmune disease. But of course, as you see from the title, uh, uh, I will introduce uh, uh, different different kind of topic. Yesterday uh, morning and afternoon. Um, you listened to the very nice and exciting presentations by uh, Rainer Straub. He talked about, in particular, about autoimmune disease, but peripheral autoimmune disease li like rheumatoid arthritis. Uh, um, now I will introduce you to uh, the main and most studied uh, central nervous system autoimmune disease, which is multiple sclerosis. Uh, and uh, I will need to anticipate some basic notion about multiple sclerosis, uh, but I will anticipate just a few because uh, uh, luckily uh, on uh, not tomorrow, but uh, and on Thursday, you will have two lectures just dedicated to uh, um, fundamentals uh, of immunology and of therapeutics of multiple sclerosis by two international experts of, of these topics, uh, uh, two clinical neurologists like uh, Antonio Uccelli and Mauro Zaffaroni, who are also uh, representatives of the Italian Association of, uh, of Neuroimmunology. So I will be very brief about the, the basic mechanisms of the disease. And I will uh, uh, try to focus uh, on some non, uh, I would like to say, I hope that it will be possible to say some non-traditional, uh, uh, non-conventional mechanisms uh, uh, in, the, in the immune system of patients with multiple uh, uh, sclerosis, uh, which are related uh, to uh, the, um, that property that also uh, Professor Maestroni was, uh, was mentioning a few minutes uh, before that property of immune cells uh, to uh, produce and utilize uh, classical uh, uh, neurotransmitters also to uh, regulate uh, a very specific uh, function. This is what we did. Uh, this is maybe the, the a good part of what we did over the last few uh, years in the field of uh, uh, neuroimmunology. This is also why I, dec I decided to uh, 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 try to speak about nervous immunity. It is some way that maybe uh, the immune system has to uh, regulate uh, itself through the use of classical uh, um, nervous signals like neurotransmitters. And so just a few, I told you, just a very, very few background about the pathogenesis of multiple sclerosis, just to understand which kind of disease we are talking about. Uh, 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 this is a, a, looks quite complicated picture that just you need to, to read this picture from left to right. In the left, this, this vertical line is just blood-brain barrier. This is periphery, and this is the central nervous system. This is just a, a, a classical representation of a lymphocytes. In particular, you see T cell, Th1 cell. Th1 cell, T helper 1 cells are believed to be the main players of uh, immunity, of the immune response uh, in, uh, in uh, the autoimmune response in multiple sclerosis. Uh, you see, this should be in some way some mechanism of activation. Uh, um, people tend to believe that the activation of the, of, uh, um, the immune system in leading to multiple sclerosis occurs in some way in periphery, maybe due to some antigen uh, uh, presentation, possibly by macrophages. You see this should be a macrophage, uh, major histocompatibility complex class 2. Yesterday we talked uh, for long about this mechanism of antigen presentation, and today we will also see some, I hope, good example about some attempt to uh, modulate also this mechanism, uh, also to cure uh, um, an autoimmune disease like multiple sclerosis. In association with this molecule, some kind of antigen. In this cartoon, they indicate microbial antigen. There is a, a lot of studies about the hypothesis that multiple sclerosis is uh, as a, an initial trigger due to the presence of some 
infectious agent. Today, uh, Hala Dengler, I saw they talked very much about the possible influence uh, of normal of pathological microbial flora uh, in the triggering of several diseases involving the immune and the nervous system. We absolutely don't know. We have a lot of epidemiological studies, some me mechanistic study about the possible role of, uh, of microorganisms uh, like viruses or bacteria in the, as initial triggers in the multiple sclerosis, but nothing is, is clearly established. In any case, uh, uh, what we believe? We believe that uh, these uh, cells, uh, which of course uh, belong to some kind of clones which are autoreactive, that is that they uh, may uh, Id identify and react to target uh, antigens, which in the case of multiple sclerosis are just related to the myelin sheath or of the glial uh, cells, become activated in the periphery and then migrate, you see migration, adhesion and penetration, and of course through adhesion molecules, proteases, chemokines, a lot of a lot of interconnected network of, of act act activating that feedback uh, uh, effects. In some way, we just cross the blood brain barrier. And of course, maybe we already mentioned that the, the peripheral uh, immune cells just patrol the nervous system with low intensity, so they can physiologically cross the blood brain barrier, but with low intensity, they just are in the central nervous system and uh, do some physiological things. Uh, uh, we mentioned yesterday, maybe you remember, the physiological role of the immune cells, for instance, in, in learning and, uh, and uh, cognition. Uh, uh, it has been very, very clearly uh, shown, in particular, in the rodent uh, models. But in this case, in particular, in case of inflammatory conditions, maybe you know that the blood-brain barrier becomes uh, increases its permeability, and so it's possible a massive uh, entry of cells into the central nervous system. Into the central nervous system, in some way, these cells undergo a reactivation, mainly due to the possibility that uh, in the central nervous system they meet uh, some resident cells, uh, which uh, in the same way have the role uh, of uh, uh, have the ability to present, again, some antigens that in this case are just central nervous system antigens. In particular, uh, people believe that it is microglia that mainly uh, has this, uh, this specific role, but we will see uh, later in this presentation that there is also a very nice and interesting area of research which addresses the astrocytes uh, as uh, another kind of uh, uh, central nervous system resident cells playing a role in the presentation of antigens and the, the activation of reactivation of the immune response in the central nervous system. And then, and then a lot of things happen, of course, because T helper cells are believed to uh, begin to proliferate, to, to secrete a lot of cytokines, uh, uh, in particular uh, pro-inflammatory T helper 1 cytokines like IL-2 and interferon gamma. In multiple sclerosis, there is a lot of studies about the role of interferon gamma as pathogenetic uh, uh, cytokine, and it seems me it's also a very instructive story about about interferon gamma in in multiple uh, sclerosis. I will mention very briefly. Maybe some of you uh, know that interferon gamma was the first cytokine with, that was used as therapeutic approach in multiple sclerosis, and why? Just because some decades ago. Uh, it was very popular, the idea that also multiple sclerosis could be triggered by microbial, uh, some microbial agent, and in particular viral agents. And so in the, in the, at, the, the, at the dawn of the era of uh, uh, knowledge about interference, you know, you know why interference uh, have this, this name, interference, uh, First property that, that was described of the, of the very large uh, and heterogeneous family of interference was just the ability of interfere with viral replication in, 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 uh, in cells. And so, of course, one plus one is two. Uh, if multiple sclerosis, uh, maybe it was a, a, a virus-triggered disease, maybe some therapy with an antiviral, very strong antiviral agent could be useful. And, and a trial was started in, in patients, uh, um, 
I don't, I don't remember now which is the paper. Maybe, maybe in neurology, it was, it was published in the 80s, the results of this trial, which was immediately stopped because after a few months, they immediately saw that patients not only didn't, did not improve, not at all, but they experienced uh, uh, very huge and strong relapses of, uh, of the, of the um, disease. And so this was the most convincing uh, uh, proof that maybe pro-inflammatory cytokines like tenfiron gamma play a key role in, uh, in, this, uh, in this disease. Why I tell you all these things about interferon gamma? Because in the next few slides, I will show you also some uh, of our experiments about the effect of interferon gamma on the system which we studied in the immune uh, system of uh, patients with, uh, with uh, multiple sclerosis. And so interferon gamma, IL-2, and in general pro-inflammatory cytokines play uh, uh, for sure, a key role in the amplification of inflammation. And then when uh, inflammation begins to be amplified in the central nervous system, a lot of different cascades uh, uh, become activated. You see not only T cells, but also macrophages, uh, which in turn produce mm, pro-inflammatory mediators like TNA alpha, pro-oxidative uh, moieties like, uh, like uh, uh, oxygen, uh, nitric oxide, uh, uh, and also activated B cells, uh, which become effective, and plasma cells, which produce antibodies. Uh, B cells, I, I will not talk about B cells, just because we did nothing about B cells, but also because uh, uh, there, there is uh, very few data about the role of B cells uh, in autoimmune disease, and in particular in multiple sclerosis, but over the last few years, uh, this is a very, very um, active area of research, and some of the latest biological therapies, in particular monoclonal antibodies, uh, uh, which are in, 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 uh, in clinical development for, uh, for multiple sclerosis, are just uh, uh, monoclonal antibodies directed against uh, B uh, cells. And so it seems to me this will be another area which, which should be considered. And of course, T cells, is it TNF alpha, complement, a lot of mechanisms which finally uh, are very aggressive towards neurons and to the, the, the myelin sheets of neurons, oligodendrocytes, the myelination, uh, a lot of different mechanisms. We will not go through all these mechanisms, uh, very complicated. And then finally, axonal damage. And uh, uh, as maybe you know, clinical manifestations of multiple sclerosis can be very heterogeneous just because it depends on the area. The so-called plaques of demyelination uh, uh, determine the clinical pattern uh, which can present in very different uh, way with sensorial, motor uh, uh, symptoms or just can be silent if some uh, uh, areas interested are just silent from the functional point of view until the disease progresses very, very, very uh, much. And so this is, in general, the, the, the picture, the picture uh, classical view of uh, main general mechanisms in the pathogenesis of multiple sclerosis. Uh, multiple sclerosis, I also told you, is a classical uh, field of research uh, uh, for uh, um, a certain kind of conventional urimmunology. Yesterday we talked about uh, main uh, fields of research, um, I would say uh, mo most important mainstreams in the field of urimmunology, and I told you that the most conventional area identified by the word neuroimmunology is just this area, that is the immunology of central nervous system disease and in particular of autoimmune disease. Uh, the International Society of Neuroimmunology and its Italian branch are just interested uh, with multiple sclerosis as with some kind of, of neuropathy, but just studying this kind of, uh, of mechanism. Uh, we will start from a little different point of view that is, uh, uh, in particular, sympathoadrenergic mechanisms uh, in multiple sclerosis. And so talking about sympathoadrenergic mechanisms, this cartoon we saw 
already yesterday. It's of a seminal uh, uh, review in Immunology Today, published in 1998 by uh, Rainer Straub. Uh, this cartoon exemplifies the two main uh, uh, pathways of communication between the central nervous system and the immune system. And these two, two pathways are just, of course, one humoral and one wiring pathway. The humoral one is the hypothalamus pituitary adrenal axis, which is mainly uh, regulates its activity through the secretion of CRH, ACTH, and in turn, finally, uh, resulting in the secretion of cortisol uh, uh, by the cortical uh, part of the, of the adrenal uh, gland. But the other one is the sympathetic nervous system, and the sympathetic nervous system affects the immune system either directly, we saw a lot of data and a lot of examples about the huge amount of knowledge which we have now, uh, regarding the existence of nerve terminals in the, in the immune lymphoid uh, uh, organs like spleen, lymph nodes, and also inflamed tissue you saw in the rheumatoid arthritis. Uh, not only adrenergic, also peptidergic, but we will talk just about adrenergic uh, uh, mechanism in this case. And now we also know a lot uh, about uh, the existence of the splanking nerve which also uh, in innervates uh, the, the medullary part of the adrenal gland, which in turn acts, acts like a ganglion, because upon activation, it secretes a lot, a very big amount of uh, uh, epinephrine, and also in part not epinephrine, not adrenaline, because maybe you know that the adrenal gland has two main uh, uh, populations of cells, uh, uh, main one secreting adrenaline, and another one secreting noradrenaline, which in turn, on the humoral side, again, uh, uh, mainly through the general circulation, uh, uh, of course, can affect directly immune cells and uh, the, 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 the immune response. Just some biochemical notion about uh, the adrenergic system, just to say that all these uh, transmitters, uh, uh, first of all, noradrenaline is not only the main neurotransmitter in adrenergic terminals in the central nervous system and in periphery, but it's also the direct precursor of uh, adrenaline, of course, noradrenaline and adrenaline. But, but in turn, all these uh, two, two transmitters uh, um, all derive from dopamine. Of course, there is no need to talk about dopamine, uh, uh, at least as regards its role. In, uh, in the central nervous system, just for instance, in the extra pyramidal stations uh, uh, in the basal ganglia, but also in, in some uh, uh, neural pathways like the uh, limbic and the mesencephalic pathways projecting to cortical, uh, uh, to cortical neurons and also in the regulation of some endocrine activity. Just remember the role of dopamine on prolactin. Yes, they also we talked a lot about, about prolactin. Uh, it seems to me that you will, uh, at the end of this course, you will know a lot of things about dopamine because also tomorrow we will have Sujit Pazu who will talk to us about catecholamines in, uh, in the regulation of, of uh, tumor growth and tumor angiogenesis. So I will say nearly nothing about this as, as regards its general role as, as, uh, as uh, immune modulator, but uh, I uh, would just uh, like to draw your attention upon the fact that dopamine is just a precursor of noradrenaline and adrenaline. And this, what does it mean? It means that all the cells which are able to produce noradrenaline and adrenaline necessarily uh, just uh, need to be able to uh, produce or at least to uh, catch uh, in, in some way uh, dopamine. Uh, now I, I will show you why this is so important for what we did in the, in the study of the some aspects of the nervous regulation of, uh, of immunity. 
Sympathodrenergic mechanisms, mechanisms in multiple sclerosis and in general in autoimmune disease. There is a, a lot of, of uh, literature, you can, you can find a lot of uh, uh, literature, a lot of papers showing the importance of uh, uh, adrenergic mechanisms in the regulation of immunity also in autoimmune disease and this was one of the main uh, uh, bases and, uh, and evidence leading uh, also to the, to, the, to the birth and development uh, of neuroimmunology and of psychoneuroimmunology. In particular, in multiple sclerosis, uh, evidence began to accrue from the, the, at least uh, the, the, the 80s, uh, end of the 70s, beginning of the 80s, and I just try to synthesize to summarize uh, uh, main uh, evidence in, in two slides. Uh, this is evidence from animal models, uh, Main evidence, for instance, in general, uh, Anselmico Scora and Arneson did a lot of work in this, uh, in this field. In the absence of sympathetic innervation, the severity of experimental autoimmune diseases uh, is uh, absolutely increased. And um, among these diseases, one of the main and most studied models was experimental autoimmune encephalitis uh, in rodents, uh, which is mainly the most popular, the most important animal model for multiple sclerosis. But what's more, there is much more, the beta adrenergic agonist isoproteranol suppressed clinical and histological EAA e e experimental allergic encephalomyelitis in rats. And more again, isoproteranol and another beta adrenergic agonist, terbutalin, both lessen the severity of the first attack of EAA and uh, decrease the frequency of relapses in another model of chronic relapsing uh, EAA in rats. And, uh, and, uh, and we start to approach uh, the, ma the main topic of this, of this talk. And in these animal models, the number of beta-adrenergic receptors uh, uh, expressed on splenocytes, that is uh, on uh, lymphocytes uh, uh, isolated from spleen, uh, which are the main kind of lymphocytes you usually study in rodent models just because rats are small and ma mice are even smaller, and so where you can catch uh, uh, enough, enough cells, of course, where usually you need to not, not to use uh, uh, only blood, uh, but in particular to use lymphoid organs. Spleen is very easy, lymph nodes, cymos for some, for some studies, of course. So why a lot of data, this is why a lot of data were obtained in, spleno, in splenocytes. The number of beta adrenergic receptors on these cells uh, from animals with this experimental autoimmune disease compared to controls were absolutely increased and terbutylene treatment lowers splenocyte receptor numbers to normal values. The increase in receptor number correlated with the severity of the disease and with the number of relapses. And again, more terbutylene treatment suppressed uh, also uh, clinical experimental allergic neuropathy, which is a disease, uh, uh, again, an experimental disease which you can uh, uh, trigger in, uh, in rodent models, uh, uh, which interests not the central nervous system, but in this case, uh, uh, peripheral, peripheral uh, nerves. Clinical evidence, uh, and clinical evidence, uh, absolutely very, very interestingly, is very similar in parallel six, uh, uh, evidence uh, in animal models. First of all, a lot of papers 1988, 1990, 1992, 93, membrane expression of beta-2 adrenoceptor in peripheral blood mononuclear cells that is all circulating lymphoid cells. And also there's a, a, a few also monocytes, but usually about 80, 90% lymphoid cells. So membrane expression of uh, beta-2 adrenoceptors on circulated lymphoid and monocytic cells uh, is upregulated in patients uh, with multiple sclerosis. Like in animal models, upregulation of beta adrenoceptors in these cells is related to disease activity. Very nice, very nice paper in Brain 1994 by, by this, this group. The increased expression, this is a very nice evidence which was not uh, investigated further, but I will tell you something about this later. Increased expression of these receptors seems to be specific not for all the cell types, but for the CD8. Uh, plus uh, and possibly even more specific for CD8 plus CD28 negative T. 
uh, lymphocytes uh, which, is, which are regarded now as possibly as an additional regulatory um, subset of T lymphocytes. And now we are coming to the more recent evidence. Uh, this is a group of uh, uh, clinical neurologists, uh, the group of, of the, uh, Maria Troiano and Paolo Livrea in, in uh, University of Bari, Journal of Pneumonology, 2004. In circulating PBMC, gene expression of beta-2 adrenoceptors and also of other G-protein coupled receptors and in particular of dopaminergic receptors D5, which from a pharmacologic, not from a pharmacological, but from a molecular, a second messenger point of view, are very similar to beta-2 adrenoceptors. That is, they share absolutely the sa same second messages, increase of uh, cyclic AMP. Gene expression is increased, but responsiveness to beta adrenoceptor agonists and also to dopaminergic agonists are on the contrary down-regulated. That is, uh, beta, beta adrenoceptors are increased, but the response is down-regulated in untreated patients, suggested the occurrence of receptor uncoupling, but restored in interferon beta-treated subjects. It seems to me that here there is a mistake because it is not gene expression which is increased in these patients, but it is uh, um, membrane expression is increased uh, and responsiveness is uh, decreased. Of course, this some, some word is lacking, but the, the picture is that in this patient, and this is absolutely reproducible observation, uh, um, to get together with, uh, with uh, colleagues in, in Bari, we reproduce this observation in several cohorts of patients. The picture is that you have uh, increased membrane expression of these receptors, decreased gene expression, uh, which we interpret possibly as a reduction of turnover of receptors, possibly due to the reduced activity of the receptors, as you can see, if in vitro you challenge with agonists, and with agonists you absolutely don't see any response. And of course, these receptors you saw in different examples in, in previous lessons in this course that in particular beta-2 adrenoceptors are key receptors uh, in the immunomodulating activity of noradrenaline, in particular uh, in the anti-inflammatory activity of adrenaline. So it seems that in peripheral immunity in these patients there is a dysregulation, a defect uh, of uh, a, a neurally mediated anti-inflammatory mechanism. And even more interesting, beta-2 adrenoceptors on, on, on the basis of all this knowledge have been already regarded as a promising target in the pharmacotherapy of multiple sclerosis. This was in particularly uh, up to the first half of uh, uh, last decade, up to 1990, 1995, because it was only in that period that interferon was, interferon beta was marketed and was the first drug marketed for multiple sclerosis. Before interferon beta, 15 or 20 years ago, we had abs absolutely no drugs for multiple sclerosis except strong immunosuppressants. And so, of course, there was a, a huge attention about this kind of opportunities. But the few uh, clinical trials we've watched were performed were, for instance, with sabutamol, a well-known anti-asthmatic drug which acts as beta adrenergic agonists, uh, just gave very few results. Uh, and we have some idea about why they gave uh, very few results, uh, and, uh, and they were just abandoned. So you, you find some... Uh, uh, literature up to this review by McClough uh, in, uh, in 2002, but thereafter there were no more attempts to use adrenergic agonists. You, we will also find some paper trying to use dopaminergic agonists uh, in, uh, in experimental animal models of multiple sclerosis, but also in this case they obtained no clear uh, results. And so where, where we would like to go, where, where we went to understand uh, better this dysregulation of uh, um, adrenergic and, and also in part of dopaminergic pathways in multiple sclerosis. We decided to study multiple sclerosis basically for two main, uh, uh, maybe for three main reasons at, uh, at the beginning of 90s. First of all, because uh, um, together with Giorgio Maestroni, thanks to the collaboration with his laboratory, we uh, finally decided, as I told you yesterday, to study an absolutely brand new area of research that was the ability of uh, um, peripheral uh, human lymphocytes to produce some classical neurotransmitters like 
catecholamines. And uh, as I showed you, dopamine, noradrenaline, and adrenaline are closely correlated from a bi biochemical point of view. And when we decided to study this system in uh, human lymphocytes, first of all, what we found? We found that, for instance, uh, uh, human lymphocytes, if you isolate uh, uh, freshly isolated circulating cells from, from human blood, you can just find traces of all these free catecholamines, dopamine, noradrenaline, and adrenaline. But this was serendipitous observation. Uh, we were studying in culture these cells. Uh, if you challenge these cells with metagenic stimulus, uh, these experiments uh, were using phytohemagglutinin. Of course, most of you know about this, uh, this stimuli, but we replicated these results of with more specific stimuli like anti-CD3, anti-CD28. Uh, you have a very uh, significant, maybe highly variable, but significant increase of all these free uh, catecholamines. This is dopamine, this is noradrenaline, this is adrenaline. This is the hours of from the beginning of culture and the beginning of stimulation. And you see that between 24 and 48 hours, you have this increase. This increase is probably related to the ability of these cells to synthesize catecholamines because we uh, also investigated the presence uh, of uh, tyrosine hydroxylase, which is the first uh, uh, enzyme in the synthesis of catecholamines, also the rate-limiting enzyme, which converts tyrosine to L-dihydroxyphenylalanine, which is in turn the precursor of dopamine. And uh, this is PCR of tyrosine hydroxylase showing that this is tyrosine hydroxylase in PC12 cells. This is in lymphocytes uh, before stimulation. This is after a few hours from stimulation, and this is after eight, 10 hours uh, uh, after the uh, beginning of stimulation. And you see that there is a clear band showing the expression of mRNA for tyrosine hydroxylase. Maybe also protein is expressed. We did a very few studies, uh, thanks to a collaboration with, uh, with the anatomist uh, group. And uh, by uh, immunoelectron microscopy, we had a few data which now we are trying to increase about the uh, presence of this very uh, strange, but nonetheless very clear vesicles uh, in activated lymphocytes which are uh, positive for tyrosine hydroxylase. I will be back later on molecular mechanisms which we are now studying about possible intracellular pathways leading to synthesis storage and release of, of catecholamines. In any case, in multiple sclerosis, we, de we decided on the basis of all this literature that I showed you that maybe multiple sclerosis could be a very, very nice and interesting disease model with uh, absolutely, of course, uh, uh, key importance for human uh, medicine to study the possible relevance of this, of this uh, system. Okay, this is just a cartoon summarizing the state of the art on the basis of these experiments. Uh, we had uh, uh, resting lymphocytes with few trace amounts of intracellular uh, dopamine, or adrenaline, and adrenaline. We knew also from literature that these lymphocytes express beta adrenoceptors and, in, in, uh, to, to some extent, also dopamine receptors. Uh, maybe they can express also transporters, but this is another topic. I will not go through this topic. The most important thing that we saw was that upon stimulation, I, I, I just skipped also uh, some other data from our experiments, uh, upon stimulation, there is a strong increase of the intracellular content of catecholamines, also an increase of receptors, and uh, uh, Giorgio Maestroni already uh, um, told you what was our working hypothesis was that these transmitters in some way uh, were made for something, uh, maybe as transmitters uh, through actin and autocrine or paracrine way on these cells. But also, for instance, we had some information about uh, the also an intracellular role of these transmitters. That is, for instance, if we uh, decided to inhibit this production, we have some good drug uh, which inhibit production of catecholamines, inhibit tyrosine hydroxylase, for instance, we saw a reduction of the um, apoptosis of, uh, of cells. And maybe we hypothesized that this could be due to the role uh, of catecholamines and in particular of dopamine due to the catechol group to act, to act uh, as an, a very strong oxidant into the, into the cells. Uh, this was another uh, reason why we, we thought that we could link this system to multiple sclerosis, because in multiple sclerosis there is also a lot of evidence regarding the reduction of the apoptosis of peripheral immune, immune cells. What we did 
what we did. So first of all, maybe I can tell you uh, I can tell you a similar story like that of Manfred Shedlovki this this morning. First of all, uh, we began to try to convince uh, our colleagues in clinical uh, neurology to uh, uh, to start some some uh, explorative study in in very patients. It, it was very difficult, of course, because. They told us, okay, very nice idea, but when coming to the, the, the idea of a clinical protocol, uh, they were very reluctant. And when we succeeded, we succeeded in convincing, in convincing uh, uh, it seems to me, just uh, open-minded neurologists like Mauro Zaffaroni, that you will, you will know in a couple of, uh, of days. And they started a very fruitful collaboration. This was the result of, the, uh, of the, the, the first study that we did at the end of the 90s. It was not so exciting. What we did, we just had samples of, of uh, blood from uh, multiple sclerosis patients and we challenged in vitro with phytohemagglutinin and we measured the production of catecholamines. It was relapsing, remitting patients. Uh, you will know about different forms of the disease. Just say that it is the main form of the disease and it is the most responsive to immunomodulating uh, uh, treatment. We found nearly nothing, I must say, and just uh, an additional an analysis of the, of the data by subgroup analysis. Maybe some of you, of, of you or most of you, if you have already a good experience, you know that when you begin to do subgroup analysis in your uh, experimental uh, data. It is because, uh, uh <laughs> it is because you, didn't, you didn't grab something very, very significant. But of course, we made this subgroup analysis uh, and uh, we, we had some nice data. And what we found, just a very, very few reduced uh, ability of, of uh, peripheral lymphocytes to produce dopamine this is dopamine in control subjects. This is dopamine in patients, patients with active phase of the disease in comparison to patients with inactive phase of the disease. Very, very, very few evidence. So maybe we, were, we have been too much naive. We were not understanding what we were doing. We, we went back to uh, in vitro experiments and what we decided to do you remember that I told you about interferon gamma as a pathogenic uh, cytokine in, in multiple sclerosis, and in the same period, of course, interferon beta was just a reference treatment in multiple sclerosis. Now we have a lot of different drugs like, uh, like Copaxone, uh, like Letiramera, and a lot of biological agents. It would be much more difficult to choose, but at that time we had just interferon beta. So we decided to, and, and of course, uh, a lot of papers uh, showing that interferon beta just acted mainly by counteracting uh, the pro-inflammatory effects uh, of interferon gamma. And so we decided just to study in vitro the effects of these two cytokines uh, on the uh, ability of human lymphocytes to produce catecholamines. Of course, we were very lucky uh, because we immediately saw very, very strong effects. This is IFN gamma on endogenous catecholamines. Dopamine, no, I don't know if this cartoon is, is maybe it's not so easy to read, but let's, let's go through together. Dopamine, noradrenaline, and adrenaline. This is levels uh, in, in. You, mu you must uh, consider, you must imagine that we have uh, lymphocytes isolated and put in culture in wells. And so uh, we understood that we needed to assay uh, catecholamines not only in cells, but also in medium. These are the levels of dopamine, noradrenaline, and adrenaline in cells. These are in medium. And finally, we also understood that we need to consider the overall amount of catecholamines. And this is the overall amount. And you see that after stimulation, this is the levels uh, of each catecholamine, and this is the concentration dependent, very nice for pharmacologists and also for any kind, it seems to me, of researchers, very nice concentration dependent um, response. And uh, this response uh, was uh, also confirmed by the ability of uh, uh, exposure to interferon gamma to absolutely block the expression and activity of tyrosine hydroxylase. So uh, interferon gamma seems in this cells to block absolutely the production of catecholamines. Very huge effect. Nearly nothing, nearly nothing. 
And then we went into Ethereum Beta, and first, again, the same significant also for all the, all the graphs. At first, we were a little bit puzzled because Interferon Beta on intracellular catecholamines did the same as Interferon Gamma. That is, catecholamines concentration dependently disappear. But in this case, uh, synthesis is not at all inhibited, but it's strongly enhanced because you see the appearance of a huge amount of cells in the medium. And if you look uh, at the total amount of, of catecholamines, you see that from these basal levels, you have a very huge increase of. Uh, uh, dopamine, noradrenaline, and uh, adrenaline. So the, the, or the whole metabolic pathway leading to the synthesis of, of catecholamines. And uh, as uh, Harald and, uh, uh, and, and Manfred also told uh, uh, this, this morning, the good news is that these data are reproducible, ev even if uh, uh, at, at, some, at some point we have some difficulty. But now this is the work. Uh, this is the work uh, of some of our PhD students, in particular Dr. De Bernardi, who is here and who was very, very much worried about these results. But these results, and that finally, are very uh, strongly reproducible, even if with some variability between uh, individuals. But it is very, very nice and evident uh, um, phenomenon. And sorry. What happens, uh, uh, another very interesting thing, what happens when you put together the two cytokines, that is, the ferron beta and interferon gamma, you have a reciprocal block. That is, interferon gamma is no more able to inhibit tyrosine hydroxylase. Tyrosine hydroxylase is expressed and production of catecholamines occurs, but interferon beta is no more able to uh, induce this so, eff so effectively the release of catecholamines in the e extracellular uh, environment. We don't know about the molecular mechanisms. We just know for sure, let's say sure, you remember the story of the two ducks, but just for sure, 50% 50 sure, that these effects are just specifically mediated through the receptors for these two cytokines. You know that interferon gamma and interferon beta are just two different and very well characterized receptors. We did some uh, pharmacological experiments with blocking antibodies, and we saw that this effect was very, very specific. And so now uh, we were a little bit encouraged, and we decided to turn back to, to clinic. In the meanwhile, this paper was published, and so also our colleagues of clinical neurologists were happy about having another paper published and were uh, more collaborative about patients. And we decided to do a more serious and more, uh, more uh, um, complicated uh, study in multiple uh, sclerosis subjects. And this was not a cross-sectional, but a longitudinal study. We decided to enroll a cohort of subjects, 45 subjects, uh, uh, which uh, were drug naive, uh, uh, which were very recently uh, diagnosed with multiple sclerosis and we, who were undergoing treatment with it and beta. And we monitored these subjects for a whole year from baseline be before beginning of treatment with interferon and uh, at some months uh, of uh, interval up to, one, up to one year. These are the characteristics. This is the treatment with the different kinds of interferon beta which are usually marketed. The, the way in which the drug was used was absolutely the, 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 the official and the conventional one, so it absolutely was not experimental. It was just what happens in people who are undergoing treatment with interferon beta. What we saw, first of all, you remember that in vitro we saw the ability of interferon beta to induce tyrosine hydroxylase and to induce the production of catecholamines. What we found here, we have only patients uh, before treatment with interferon and after one, three, six, twelve months of treatment with interferon beta. We don't have controls, but when then we, we cached historical controls uh, and we found that levels of gene expression of tyrosine hydroxylase in lymphocytes in healthy controls is exactly what you reach after 12 months of treatment with interferon beta in patients. Patients have very low expression of tyrosine hydroxylase, and this is what they finally what they finally uh, have. This is about production of uh, catecholamines. Uh, maybe this is also why in the first study we just saw nothing, because this is production of catecholamines uh, uh, black 
black columns, uh, uh, resting cells, uh, 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 sorry, resting cells and stimulated cells. Black columns, uh, patients before, just drug naive, before treatment, just with disease. And uh, white columns after one year of treatment. In the first study, we just uh, took patients uh, who were on treatment. At different times, we were not aware that we did this was important. And maybe this now you, you see very clear effect just before and after treatment. Somewhere before treatment, these cells are just not able to produce, produce uh, significant amounts of, of catecholamines. But after treatment, again, they produce very uh, good, good levels uh, of dopamine, of noradrenaline, and of adrenaline. And also, this was just some additional experiment. Also, the inhibition uh, um, induced by interferon gamma is less after clinical treatment with interferon uh, beta. I don't know, I hope that the, the, this experiment was clear. It's clear, this is just not interferon beta in vitro, this is just cells from patients uh, before and after one year treatment with interferon uh, beta. And so this is very clear, at least the involvement of this system in the, in the clinical response to the uh, treatment with an immunomodulating agent. Uh, we also uh, looked at not only at the ability to produce catecholamines, but uh, uh, also to receptors. And we saw some very interesting things. Uh, uh, beta true adenoceptors, uh, you uh, uh, I showed you a huge amount of literature about uh, the, the dysregulation of beta 2 adrenergic pathways in uh, immune cells of multiple sclerosis uh, subjects. What we saw, we confirmed the literature. I told you that this is very reproducible observation. Beta-2 adenoceptors have just uh, absolutely depressed gene expression, even if they are upregulated at the membrane level. But the membrane level is just uncoupled to the second messenger system. So you have a lot of beta-2 adrenoceptors, but just no response. Maybe just because you have uncoupling, uh, uh, as just is shown by low gene expression, possibly due to the low need of the cell to produce receptors. If receptors are not used, why we should... Uh, lose energy doing proteins we are just not used but but upon treatment with interferon again you have this very nice upregulation and uh, uh, in collaboration with the group of Bari uh, Maria Troiano and Paolo Livrea we also showed that this increase of beta adrenoceptors was uh, uh, um, coupled to uh, uh, restored functional responsiveness so uh, just one anticipation uh, we propose that a very uh, potential uh, explanation for the failure of uh, initial trials with beta-2 agonists, I told you about sabutamol in, in multiple sclerosis, was just because uh, those trials uh, did not take into account that receptors in particular in the peripheral immune system were just not responsive. So you can just give agonists, but you have nothing for the agonist to act upon. And this is why it seems, to, it seems to us that maybe upon this data, uh, it could be possible to propose that um, beta-2 agonists can be used, but as add-on to improve the efficacy of immunomodulating treatment. Just remember that interferon beta gives a very good response uh, measured over two years, uh, measured upon the rate of relapsing in multiple sclerosis. <laughs> in about between uh, 60 and 70 percent of patients. So of course, you have very good margin of improvement for this, for this uh, um, therapy. Of course, from the clinical uh, neurological point of view, in the meanwhile, some very nice uh, uh, biological agents have been marketed, for instance, natalizumab, uh, a very uh, original new brand, new monoclonal antibody against integrins. Uh, this blocks just migration of uh, uh, in peripheral immune cells into the central nervous system, and it has a an excellent rate of uh, clinical response. And uh, a lot of people are, are absolutely happy. It is more than 90% clinical response, and a lot of people are absolutely happy about the rate of response and therapeutic efficacy of this kind of drugs. Unfortunately, these kind of drugs uh, being just very, very targeted and selective immunomodulating agents, but 
just uh, bring uh, and maybe not so defined risk that is the risk of reactivation of some uh, uh, infectious disease in particular viral disease leading uh, in some cases fortunately in the with very low rates uh, but with difficult prediction in some cases leading to uh, very strong cases of uh, encephalitis. And so it seems to me this makes still uh, a good space for development of these immunomodulating treatments uh, in, uh, in uh, uh, neuroimmunomodulating treatments of atherosclerosis. In the same study, we also looked at dopamine receptors. We were interested also in dopamine because you see increase in production of adrenaline is always uh, uh, coupled to increase in production in dopamine. And what we saw, we looked at three of the five uh, types of dopamine receptors, just two D2-like kinds and, and one, the D5, uh, which of course had a few literature. What we found, nothing for these three. So again, uh, this is uh, also a nice proof for specificity uh, of, the, of the effects which we observe. You see nothing for these three, same significance before treatment and after one, three, six, 12 months of treatment. but strong down regulation of D2-like receptors, which are just uh, from the pharmacological point of view opposite to D1-like receptors, like D1 and D5, and strong up regulation of D5 receptors, which are just like beta 2 adrenal receptors in their uh, effects. I'm just simplifying a little the, the, the view, but just for, for the sake of, of, uh, of shortness. And so, um, we turn now to the second part of this, of this story because in the meanwhile, in our basic research, we just turned to uh, another specific subset of lymphocytes. I was mentioning before the opportunity to go to try to see not only all the circulating cells, but to try to dissect uh, the specific subsets of circulating cells because, of course, all of you who is involved in immunological studies know that uh, circulating cells are just a lot of subsets which can be not so easily divided. I told you before that in the central nervous system you can just see areas and neurons and for the shape of neuron, the, the position of neuron, you can be sure that this is pyramidal neuron, this is uh, the uh, specific nucleus. Of course, in the peripheral nervous system you just try to understand looking at CD, looking at phenotype, but you can also uh, not be absolutely sure because also phenotype is dynamic, it just changes upon activation, upon a lot of situations, so it's much, much more difficult in the periphery. But in any case, uh, we are absolutely convinced that this idea to go to subsets of cells uh, and cells in particular functional conditions, maybe also in particular tissues, should be a key to understand the, the details of this uh, uh, system. So what we did, Again, serendipity, why we turn to uh, CD4 regulatory T lymphocytes. Uh, uh, now I would like to ask, to, to, to tell you, just because we absolutely studied a lot and we were convinced and it was absolutely genius, not at all. We were just asked to collaborate in a, in a, in a, in a project, very complicated project uh, in which there was the opportunity Nothing, nothing at all to do with what we were doing, but there was the opportunity to do something very, very, very... But project was about uh, organ transplantation. And so uh, we had the need to understand something about uh, immune response in organ transplantation, and we were asked to study and to learn what, it, what, uh, what regulatory uh, T lymphocytes were and to study something about the biology of these cells. And we started, and we started, and it, it seems to me it was just some 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 very very serendipitous things because uh, in particular there is a lot of different subsets of regulatory cells but in particular the 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 most popular the most studied subset that is cd4 plus cd25 plus FAXP 3 plus uh, FAXP 3 is a mm, particular uh, um, transcription factor, which is typical of this subset are just so called naturally occurring and also they have the phenotype, they are, ener they are energic, energic, they are not effector cells, just energic, but they have the phenotype of activated cells. And so we thought maybe, maybe it's possible, you remember activated cells express tyrosine hydroxylase, express receptors for noradrenaline, for dopamine, maybe. And of course, maybe we were abs absolutely uh, um, 
uh, lucky because this is just very but uh, Giorgio already showed uh, showed uh, the, the this uh, this paper we are very proud of this paper just because we saw we saw it was absolutely nice experiments very easy with very good results uh, huge amounts of catecholamines in these cells just freshly isolated huge amounts in comparison to effector lymphocytes that is CD4 uh, T cells uh, uh, not stimulated just freshly isolated nearly nothing and in these cells a lot of a lot of catecholamines uh, a lot of receptors this is in comparison to human brain uh, and this is just dopaminergic receptors we also look at beta adrenoceptors and alpha adrenoceptors but I will be short I will talk just about dopamine uh, and dopaminergic receptors uh, uh, a lot of D2, D3, maybe just D3, I don't know, D4 and a lot of D5 and uh, a lot of dopamine, a lot of D5 receptors and this is little bit complicated experiments but it's just a classical experiment to show the functional effects of these cells why they are regulatory just because they regulate in an inhibitory fashion the, the uh, response, the proliferation and the cytokine production of effector T lymphocytes and in vitro how can you measure their activity? Just make co-culture. Yesterday evening, uh, Professor Akol uh, showed you uh, how to measure uh, the activity of uh, T-regulatory cells from mice. It's absolutely the same from men. Of course, it's not exactly the same, but we, we can just say this for the sake of this, of this talk now. And this is proliferation uh, of effector cells alone. This is absence of proliferation of effector cells uh, with regulatory cells. This is a, a complete reversal of uh, uh, proliferation when, if we put dopamine acting the directly on the dopamine D5 receptors, we did a lot of pharmacological experiments with selective agonists, uh, antagonists, but also if we put reserpine or if we put some agents which can induce outflow of uh, dopamine from the cells. And all this is just to show that this reversal induced by reserpine is uh, selectively antagonized by the 1D5 antagonists and not by all the other antagonists, including beta and alpha adrenoceptor, uh, adrenoceptor antagonists. So we were very proud of these results uh, and we of course we immediately made a brand new cartoon including uh, regulatory uh, cells and a lot of additional hypotheses to, to uh, work on these cells. Uh, the main, uh, the main uh, uh, result was that we were convinced to have shown an uh, autocrine loop based on dopamine may be produced and released by the same cells and playing an inhibitory effect uh, on the regulatory activity on these cells. And so, and so we decided to come back to the multiple sclerosis model in, clinical, uh, in the clinical setting and we did absolutely the same protocol as, uh, as you saw before and another one, but now uh, specifically looking at the subset of regulatory cells uh, and for comparison to the subset of effector cells. Uh, the, the, the experimental design is absolutely the same. In this case, we decided to include also healthy control, just study once, uh, one year of interferon beta treatment, a drug naive patients uh, from 0, 3, 6, and 12 months, uh, and the same phenotyping. Uh, we also measured the frequency of the various subsets. Uh, um, okay, I will skip up on this data, otherwise it will be uh, too much long. Maybe if you want, we can comment later, but it's not it's not uh, the key the key the key message. Uh, starting from uh, we we looked at dopaminergic receptors, we looked at tyrosine hydroxylase, we looked at function of these cells. You remember that D3 receptors uh, in uh, in uh, the whole population of circulating lymphocytes were not so changed. The same here just a few statistical significance in uh, the regulatory fraction of cells but it seems to me it's not so not so interesting and uh, absolutely nothing in uh, effect of cells please look also at the the scale of course because this is just for comparison but 
the scale is much higher just to say that dopamine receptors are uh, absolutely more expressed at baseline in the regulatory subset of cells uh, but not in the factor subset this is just for comparison but this is D5 D5 receptors you remember D5 receptors uh, in vitro uh, it is possibly the receptor mediating the inhibitory effect of dopamine on the function of uh, uh, regulatory lymphocytes and also the, the receptor that's uh, in uh, um, in PBMC as a whole was down regulated and uh, up uh, is uh, up regulates uh, after treatment with interferon beta this is absolutely opposite situation in uh, the regulatory subset of patient with multiple sclerosis uh, you have a uh, relative upregulation of this receptor before treatment with interferon. This is control subjects. And step by step, you have reduction of this receptor down to very low, very low levels. This is for comparison, uh, effect of lymphocyte, but this is, this is 2.5, this is 1.5. This is just a few upregulation. This is probably mirroring what we saw in in peripheral blood mononuclear cells. I just forgot to tell you, sorry, that uh, this subset of regulatory lymphocytes uh, represents just a very small fraction, about 2-4% of total lymphocytes. And of course, uh, in uh, when you say total lymphocytes, uh, you absolutely can expect to see nothing about this specific uh, uh, subset. And this is tyrosine hydroxylase. Um, enzyme producing catecholamines, the same as D5, uh, relatively upregulated in regulatory cells before treatment with interferon, and step by step, very quickly and very strongly down, uh, down regulated. As all these changes, some uh, uh, difference, uh, this is, was also another, another data, but we skip uh, also about this data. This, this has also something to have to, 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 to do with functional aspects. We did functional studies in a subset of, of patients, uh, just a subset of patients, because, as I told you, uh, regulatory lymphocytes in circulating blood are very few, and to do these functional experiments, you need a lot of blood. It's very easy with buffy coats. It's absolutely not easy with fresh blood from, from uh, subjects, and in particular from patients. So it was just a few patients in whom we did these studies. Uh, this is what happens in healthy controls, uh, absolutely the same which happened in our uh, previous in vitro experiments, that is proliferation of effective T cells alone, inhibition uh, of proliferation with regulatory cells, uh, and again reversal of inhibition with dopamine. This is what happens uh, in patients uh, uh, before treatment with interferon. Proliferation of effective T cells is nearly the same as controls. Uh, uh, regulatory cells apparently do the same uh, inhibitory effect as controls. So maybe in this case we don't find a primary deficit of these uh, uh, cells. And dopamine reverts this effect. But after 12 months of treatment with interferon, we see first of all very, very strongly diminished uh, proliferation of effector cells alone. So possibly this is a very good, uh, very good uh, demonstration of the immuno, uh, the, 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 the primary intrinsic immunomodulatory anti-inflammatory effects of interferon beta. In this case, uh, regulatory cells still have a regulatory activity. It seems just a few, but in percentage is about maybe nearly the same because this is about maybe 60% reduction, 60-70%. This is about 50-60% reduction of the baseline. But you remember uh, dopamine receptors just down regulated and in this case dopamine has no more effects on these uh, uh, cells. So very Nice, maybe a little bit complicated, so we will try to summarize uh, all this data uh, in this table. What happens in patients, uh, untreated uh, patients, and patients treated with interferon beta? In untreated patients, in the whole population of lymphocytes, we have reduced tyrosine hydroxylase and reduced production of catecholamines. We have reduced beta-2 adrenoceptors. I should say also we had that we have reduced the five, uh, the five uh, uh, receptors. Uh, and, uh, of course, this is a mistake. We have also reduced the five receptors. 
and after interferon beta in the general population of lymphocytes, and so we believe also in particular in effect of lymphocytes in T-helper-1 lymphocytes, but this is inference, we need to do experiments. We have upregulation up to normal of tyrosine hydroxylase, and in particular the responsiveness of beta-2 uh, and uh, D5 pathways. So these pathways in effector cells play a, a useful role, an anti-inflammatory uh, immunomodulating role in these cells. And uh, uh, quite luckily, in, regula in regulatory cells, we have just increased tyrosine hydroxylase and D5, which are the key elements of that autoinhibitory dopaminergic loop inhibition of regulatory function of uh, uh, regulatory uh, cells, uh, just uh, inhibition of inhibition just results uh, in enhancement, possibly, of uh, the immune response. But after treatment with interferon, uh, we have strong downregulation of the system, and as you saw, also lack of response to dopamine. And so it seems to us that this is a good basis now to imagine, if it will be possible, just clinical trials not, of course, of beta adrenergic of, or dopamine agonists alone, but as uh, co-medications after immunomodulating treatment uh, uh, was effective in restoring uh, the, the, the function of this uh, uh, pathway. And again, okay, this is just a story. Now I will tell you very quickly um, what, we, what we are doing now in several directions. Uh, uh, this was the story from multiple sclerosis, but maybe, maybe you know that multiple sclerosis uh, um, defined uh, multiple sclerosis is uh, preceded uh, at, the, at the beginning by the so-called clinically isolated uh, uh, syndrome that is just what it, it's the first clinical manifestation, uh, the first just why clinically isolated? Because it's just first neurological manifestation, and of course, uh, uh, according to uh, uh, current guidelines, uh, uh, we cannot uh, yet uh, speak about multiple sclerosis because need confirmation, and uh, uh, luckily, uh, lo a lot of these patients just have only this attack and n nothing more in their, in their life. But uh, at least, uh, according to studies, 30 or 40 percent of these patients just progress to multiple sclerosis uh, in about, uh, in about a, a year. And so uh, we decided to, to start a protocol in this kind of patients because, first of all, we would like to know if this modification in the expression of receptors and markers related to the adrenergic and dopaminergic system were just uh, a late phenomenon in multiple sclerosis, so just preceded the clinical uh, manifestation, and maybe it could be also a biomarker of, uh, of the disease, and maybe also if it could also uh, be a, a marker for prediction of conversion to multiple sclerosis. This was just, it has just been uh, started, this study, um, just a few patients were enrolled, these are preliminary, preliminary data, but just to show that in particular tyrosine hydroxylase expression this is, in, uh, this is in peripheral blood mononuclear cells. This is resting cells. This is uh, cells after stimulation. White uh, boxes are LC controls, uh, and uh, etched boxes uh, are subjects with uh, just, just immediately a few weeks after clinically isolated syndrome. And you see that in vitro. You can see just uh, uh, this is just, it seems to me, eight controls and uh, 13 patients. You have uh, already a clinically significant upregulation of tyrosine, of tyrosine hydro hydroxylase. Interestingly, this is just the opposite that you see in patients. Here you have upregulation. Maybe you remember that in patients you have downregulation. But we also look at, at uh, uh, regulatory T lymphocytes and we looked at FOXP3, which, which is the marker for regulatory lymphocytes, which is highly expressed uh, in, the, in the regulatory fraction and very low expression in the effect of fraction. And in the regulatory fraction, okay, FOXP3 is fraction, which is uh, usually taken as a surrogate index uh, of the function of these cells, uh, you see no change. So uh, we had no opportunity, no possibility to do functional studies because of the, of the, 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 the huge amount of blood it's impossible to do functional uh, studies, but if this is a surrogate marker, we can say that maybe these cells just have the same 
regulatory potential, potential. But if in these cells, T regulatory cells are just the, this, we go and look uh, about tyrosine hydroxylase, D2, D5, and beta 2 adrenocyte expression, we see that, okay, tyrosine hydroxylase seem nearly the same, maybe a few of regulation, but nearly the same as controls, but D5 receptors, just a few, but significantly more expressed. So maybe, maybe, of course, it's just, it's just a very preliminary interpretation, maybe an early manifestation of the, of the, 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 the clinical, uh, um, the clinical picture can be an early impairment, not an impair, an imp functional impairment of regulatory cells, maybe, maybe not just due, but uh, in which uh, a contribution uh, is given by an increase of the functional relevance uh, of D5 receptor mediated inhibition. But, but uh, we, will, we, will, we will see in the future, it seems to me that in one year this study should be finished uh, and we will see what will be the results. Now in the last few minutes I will come to the final part of this talk because just to, to give you a complete uh, uh, picture of uh, uh, the, the, the nervous immunity in, uh, in multiple sclerosis, we need to talk about not only our studies, of course, I, I, even if we are very gratified to speak about our studies, but also to another very uh, interesting and promising area of, this, of research that is immunity in the central nervous system. I told you before about astrocytes, uh, and there is a German group who is uh, uh, strongly involved, and uh, it's uh, uh, several years uh, that works uh, on central astrocytes in a lot of central nervous system diseases, and in particular in multiple sclerosis. And uh, what they saw, first of all, just a, just a short premise, uh, that is uh, uh, central astrocytes together with microglia and, uh, and uh, oligodendrocytes uh, and so are, are uh, uh, part of the glia. Microglia is the main immune cells in the central nervous system, but there is a lot of evidence that also astrocytes can play a role as immune cells, in particular under certain circumstances. And in these cells, uh, just to be short, uh, these cells usually express uh, uh, high levels of beta adrenoceptors uh, and endogenous noradrenaline is able to induce in these cells uh, an anti-inflammatory and neuroprotective phenotype through a lot of different very interesting mechanisms. First of all, I just say the two most important. The main most important uh, anti-inflammatory and neuroprotective is the induction of of the production of uh, neurotrophic uh, uh, peptides. And the most important uh, anti-inflammatory, or maybe not the most important, but most interesting in this context, is the ability to suppress the activity of, of uh, uh, C2TA, this main, uh, the, the same transactivator of the major histocompatibility complex class two, uh, which Professor Akola was talking about yesterday in oncology. C2TA can be expressed also in astrocytes in a lot of different cells on the course, and it plays exactly its main role, that is the promotion of the expression of uh, MHC class two. And if C2TA is activated in these cells, these cells can uh, become antigen-presenting cells. So they are uh, facultative antigen-presenting cells. And the idea, uh, based on all the data that this group was able to produce over the last 15 years. The idea is that the loss, very clear loss that can be, can be shown in autoptic uh, um, examination of brains from multiple sclerosis subjects is that the loss of beta adrenoceptor regulation of these cells uh, um, just is a loss of a break uh, which makes these cells uh, able to uh, contribute to the strong activation of the immune response in the central nervous system, which of course in multiple sclerosis. So the idea, first of all, was to try to act directly on, uh, on beta adrenoceptors, but of course in these cells beta adrenoceptors are not present. Uh, we don't know what it happens after treatment with interferon beta, no one looked, maybe these beta adrenoceptors are upregulated, maybe no. But this group just decided to look not at beta adrenoceptors, which are not present. They decided just to look at the downstream uh, events that are activated by beta adrenoceptors in these cells. And these downstream events include the activation uh, of uh, protein kinase A, which in turn inhibits usually. So if you have functional beta adrenoceptors in astrocytes, 
you succeed in activating, in tonically activating protein kinase A, a very complicated, of course, pathway, but which finally uh, ends in protein kinase A, which in turn, you see, it inhibits C2TA, which is the transactivator of uh, uh, a lot of things, uh, and first of all, uh, of the ability of these cells to present the antigen, so to be antigen-presenting cells. And, and we have some drugs uh, who, uh, which, um, are not exactly uh, uh, immunomodulating drugs, but for instance, fluoxetin. I, I, I this morning you did remember that we mentioned uh, when we talked about antidepressants. A lot of antidepressants has, have also some very heterogeneous and complicated uh, uh, and not completely understood ability to be anti-inflammatory. In particular, fluoxetin, which maybe uh, uh, you know, this one of the main SSRI antidepressants is also a very good activator of protein kinase A, and so it was, u it was used by this uh, German group in a preliminary exploratory um, phase two trial in multiple sclerosis subjects with relapsing remitting multiple sclerosis. Of course, it was very small trial because they did this be between 2004 and 2006, very small. Uh, you imagine now you, we have a lot of very effective drugs for multiple sclerosis, and so it's very difficult to have uh, uh, to obtain by ethics committees to do trials with placebo in uh, in multiple sclerosis. And of course, they did just a proof of concept over a very short time, just 24 weeks in a limited number of subjects. They just enrolled 19 patients for each arm of the of the study. 19 in placebo and 19 in uh, fluoxetin. But what they obtained, they just measured cumulative number of new enhancing lesions. So they just did some instrumental, uh, not, not clinical assessment, efficacy of treatment in multiple sclerosis. Uh, uh, it seems to me that Mauro Zaffaroni and Antonio Celli will tell us that need to be evaluated over longer period and on clinical scales, usually at least two years. Uh, and in this case, just instrumental data. But you see that instrumental data was absolutely promising. This was progression with placebo. And of course, this is also why you understand this. We need to, 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 to stop very quickly this kind of trials. And this is progression with fluoxetine. Of course, uh, very small trial, very short trial. What will be next? But since to me, it's very, it's very promising and an original approach to this kind of, uh, of uh, target. I will skip upon, uh, upon this just to be short because I would like just to tell you just uh, since me three slides so you, you can relax. Mm -hmm. Just three slides uh, just to say what we are doing now in our lab in general from a basic point of view. I told you uh, we think that uh, we should look at subsets uh, of uh, lymphocytes to understand different regulation in different subsets. At present, we have a dedicated project uh, uh, with a postdoc uh, a fellow from, from New Delhi. Unfortunately, now he is uh, uh, at home because he is doing his final examination to obtain, to obtain PhD, but he will be here to complete the study. And he is focusing on CD8 T lymphocytes. You remember I told you CD8 plus CD28 minus T lymphocytes, and I hope that we will obtain some basic evidence about dopamine systems in this subset uh, to continue to the clinical setting. And the preliminary results are very promising because you see this is just gene expression of dopamine receptors, sort of tyrosine hydroxylase. I show you D5 receptors in blue and tyrosine hydroxylase in red just to show you that apparently these are the subset that in comparison to other subsets express more tyrosine hydroxylase, consider that this is log scale, express more tyrosine hydroxylase in comparison to PBMC, to effector cells and to regu regulatory uh, CD4 regulatory cells and express good amount of D5 but also very huge amount of D2-like receptors. So, a lot of things to understand. Okay, this is one project. This is a little bit obscure, but it is another project. Maybe this is better and this is more encouraging results. This is what is doing uh, uh, Dr. Zriti De Bernardis, who is just uh, uh, preparing the final dissertation for her PhD in, uh, in uh, pharmacology. And she studied from the molecular point of view 
the presence. We to, uh, Rainer Straub talked very much yesterday about this protein. This is vesicular monoamine transportant type 2, which is the main intracellular transportant involved uh, in the uh, storage of catecholamines in the catecholamine producing cells. We decided to study this protein lymphocytes to understand, first of all, is the mechanisms for storage were uh, the same as in, uh, in uh, neurons and in chromaffin cells. Apparently, this is the case. Uh, this is some preliminary. There is a huge amount of experiments uh, which Sriti did. And uh, um, just to show you that there is a very strong positivity for this uh, uh, protein in activated lymphocytes. And also co localization with dopamine beta hydroxylase, which maybe you know this is the, the enzyme which converts uh, uh, dopamine to noradrenaline and usually is associated with vesicles in which catecholamines are stored. And finally, and finally, okay, all the people who were involved in this uh, in these studies, I told you about uh, um, Tanzila Med, uh, who is doing research on CD80 cells. I told you about Rita De Bernardi, who is doing research about vesicular and monoamine transport. This is our uh, staff. You will know Franca Marino and what she's doing in the next uh, few uh, lectures, it seems to me, tomorrow uh, about uh, vascular inflammation. Mauro Zaffaroni and Angelo Ghezzi. Mauro Zaffaroni will talk to you about multiple sclerosis. Rainer Straub, uh, you saw the excellent work that they do. This is a, a consortium of microscopy with whom we collaborate for all these studies of uh, immunocytochemistry. And George Maestroni, we will never finish to thank him for all his support. Okay, thank you very much. It seems to me it's enough.